Um, welcome all to the <coughs> Friedery, but not a Friedery lecture, <coughs> given by uh, Dr. Eugene Glazer, who is a, a writer, a radio producer, uh, and an associate research fellow at Birkbeck College, University of London. Some of you may have come across him as well in the pages of the Guardian because she uh, frequently writes a nasty word column for uh, a newspaper. She has taught courses in Renaissance literature and critical theory, and she's particularly interested in ideology, politics, cultural theory, British tolerance, and religious identities. She combines several of these <coughs> interests in uh, quite a lot of her publications, like uh, Judaism without Jews, Philosemitism, and Christian polemic in early modern England, or another <coughs> collection of essays that she's working on at the moment, provisionally entitled Religious Tolerance in Early Modern England, Historical and Contemporary uh, Reflections. She's going to talk to us today about ideology now. Uh, and I think Dr. Eliane Glazer is one of these intellectuals that uh, straddle both academia and the media. Uh, <coughs> it's, I think, I think something or two different sides of an activity that for her are not discontinuous or discrepant, but very much all of a piece. They come from uh, an engagement in the public sphere, what Steve was referring to yesterday as the Nash Publica, uh, and I think interventions from people like her are more and more necessary these days to uh, sniff out what George Orwell would have called the smelly little orthodoxies at the time. So join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Elliot Glaze. Thank you for that very polite introduction. And I'm delighted to be speaking here today, particularly as this conference addresses an urgent need for more academic analysis of contemporary political and cultural discourse and the need for a greater recognition of the vital role that the humanities can play in that analysis. The concept of ideology and the practice of ideology critique are, I think, absolutely central to this enterprise because they enable us to understand the messages both explicit and implicit that surround us in contemporary politics media and culture. But ideology is a term with a bewildering and contradictory range of meanings, and it means very different things inside and outside the academy. Most ordinary people, I think, when asked, would say that the word ideology means a set of overt political beliefs, like communism, Marxism, or free market economics. The Oxford English Dictionary defines ideology as a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. But ideology also has a more covert meaning, that of a message delivered, as it were, under the radar, a message that is somehow mendacious or dissembling. Like another word, propaganda, it means something obvious and something underhand at the same time. And I find it fascinating that ideology is a word with two, at least two different meanings, one which is seemingly directly opposed to the other. In 1845, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote that in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in a camera obscura. This image seems to suggest that ideology produces a strange, topsy-turvy effect where reality is the opposite of appearance. In this upside-down world, powerful elites project an inverted version of reality, which serves to uphold their own interests by claiming, for example, that success is always the product of hard work, 
or that success is within everyone's reach if they just work hard enough. This illusion is sold to the working classes and arguably internalised by them as natural and universal, even though it serves the ruling class's partisan interests. The result of this process is sometimes described as false consciousness. There's been a great deal of debate about the concept of ideology as articulated by Marx and Engels. Some, like Joseph McCartney, have convincingly questioned the notion that ideology as defined by Marx and Engels is a matter of false perception, of susceptibility to illusion. They have argued instead that this version of ideology is about lived experience rather than epistemology. Nevertheless, I find the camera obscure metaphor irresistible as it describes so effectively how ideology operates in the contemporary world, <coughs> namely by producing these very inversions. And I'll be giving some examples of this phenomenon shortly. It also seems to me an elegant and telling irony that the camera obscure image also serves as a metaphor for the contradictory meanings of the term ideology itself. Marx and Engels' allusions to ideology were developed by a series of subsequent thinkers. Two of the most potent contributions for my purposes are Louis Althusser's account of ideology as internalised subjugation and then Antonio Gramsci's concept of hegemony or the cultural tricks which the ruling classes use to persuade everyone else to willingly consent to their subordinate status. But the word ideology was actually coined in mid-18th century France by a man called Antoine de, de Tracy. Born into an aristocratic family, Tracy rebelled against his class and became a key player in the French Revolution, only to find himself imprisoned during the terror that followed. It was in his cell that he came up with a plan for a universal, objective science of ideas. What was needed, he declared, was a, a Newton of the science of thought, and he put himself up for this job. Tracy's project grew out of the Enlightenment and positivist belief in applying the systematic logic of rational thought to all areas of political, economic, and social life. But in jail, Tracy developed his own form of inquiry with explosive philosophical and political implications. His project was to analyse how ideas are formed, as it were, from the ground up, by a human being's direct experience of the material world. By, anal by analysing how ideas came into being in the first place, Tracy aimed to create a sceptical tool capable of unmasking the foundations and validity of received wisdom and established authority. It was not surprising that he claimed he'd made a philosophical breakthrough that could, in, that could transform the entire world. Sensing the full revolutionary implications of Tracy's project, Napoleon poured scorn on them, calling him and his followers dreamers and windbags. <coughs> Napoleon was perhaps aware that Tracy's deconstructive methodology rendered him the very opposite of a dreamer, because Tracy was exposing the material basis of ideas. Ideology was contradictory, therefore, right from its very origins. According to one sense, a neutral anatomy of ideas, rather like the modern Oxford English Dictionary de definition. According to another, a radical removal of the intellectual underpinnings of the dominant social order. From the start, therefore, ideology also meant ideology critique. So the paradox at the heart of ideology's definition seems to me to be axiomatic of the camera obscure world we now live in, where overt messages contain a kind of unheimlich un obverse, an undermining or a revealing subconscious. And to see the two meanings of overt and covert ideology in action, we can take the example of British Prime Minister David Cameron's public spending cuts. They were frequently denounced by critics as motivated by ideology. This is the first overt meaning of the word. Critics in the Labour Party 
accused the Conservatives of an ideological desire to shrink the welfare state. But in a key speech to defend the cuts, Cameron said, we are not doing this because we want to, driven by theory or ideology. We are doing this because we have to. Here we can see ideology at work in its other covert form. The cuts were indeed driven by a right-wing ideological intent. You can see that in the fact that Conservative members of Parliament cheered as the austerity measures were unveiled. But claiming that the move was simply a matter of economic necessity ensured that this intent remained largely hidden. <coughs> it seems to me that ideology in both senses of the word, covert and overt, is currently under attack. Within the academy, the, the critique of covert forms of ideology seems, at least in the UK, to have gone out of fashion. I think it's important to ask why this has happened. Is it that people think ideology critique is something people did in the 60s and 70s, but not now? Is it the result of a triumph of neoliberal ideology within the academy, so that ideology critique is identified as essentially a strategy of the old left? Is it the result of the scientization of sociology, so that cultural analysis has given way to a reductive empiricism? Is there a discomfort about the very notion of a stable reality that ideology could obscure? If that is the case, I think it will be the result of an unfortunate and surely accidental collusion between postmodern relativism and elite power. Because in a world of Facebook, Twitter, 3D TV, and hyper-reality computer games, of ever more sophisticated spin, public relations and viral advertising campaigns, of image and spectacle <coughs> and confected sincerity. It seems to me that, as Rogerard has observed, reality is more obscured now than it was in the past, and that this obscuring of reality serves <coughs> to benefit political leaders and multinational corporations. Perhaps there is a kind of squeamishness now within the academy, and especially amongst the academic left, about the idea of false consciousness <coughs> and its relationship with power and status, about the extent to which we internalise forms of dominant ideology which are at, at odds with our best interests, and the extent to which we fail to detect the ideological subtext of apparently benign elite pronouncements. If we are du duped, who is doing the duping? And are some people more duped than others? Are those at the top of the social hierarchy consciously and deliberately duping those at the bottom? And are those at the bottom more gullible than those at the top? Is it patronising to expect those people to think and act in a certain way? Is it not up to them to decide if they are downtrodden or not? Well, I do think that some people are better informed than others and that there is a correlation between being well informed and having more resources. I also think it's right to question why those who have less resources than others are not more likely to resist their subjugation. But it also seems clear that it's not only those at the lower end of the hierarchy who suffer from false consciousness. The workaholic banker comes to mind. Finally, I think it's interesting to wonder if the lack of analysis of covert forms of ideology within the academy is ironically also an example of the decline of overt ideology of theoretical isms. Outside the academy too, there is a strong resistance to decoding covert forms of ideology. For example, there is not even a popular sense that ideology means anything other than overt political beliefs. And even within the terms of public debate, I sense a widespread discomfort with concepts such as delusion, duping, and so on. There is a ubiquitous rhetoric of consumer savviness. We are supposed to be self-determining, astute readers of adverts and media spin, which is great news for the corporations and politicians who are trying, frankly, to deceive us. The savviness rhetoric is assisted 
by a general backlash against Freudian psychoanalysis and a new celebration of the comforting realism of neuroscience. A Time magazine cover in 1993 asked, is Freud dead? The implied answer was yes, um, intellectually as well as in reality. And a series of books aimed at the general reader shunning Freud's legacy were published during the 90s, including titles such as Seductive Mirage and Why Freud Was Wrong. Our bookshops are now full of popular books about neuroscience and pseudo-scientific extrapolations from MRI scans promote a simplistic neuro-realism. It's as if we no longer wish to acknowledge that we, or our culture itself, has a contradictory subconscious, that we need to read between the lines, or that things might not be what they seem. I'll talk more about the resistance to overt ideology in public debate later on, but for now I'd like to describe some instances of my sense that we are living in a topsy-turvy world, that appearance is the, is the very opposite of reality, and that the systemic distortion of reality works to benefit corporate and political elites, but with the consent, often, of ordinary people. I feel myself to be living in a world dominated by phenomena which are seemingly disparate, but which share the same features. The use of fig leaves and window dressing to produce progressive and egalitarian illusions. David Cameron, again, I do like to talk about David Cameron because he's such a perfect example of this, <coughs> who is a radically right-wing prime minister, boasts that the Conservatives are now the party of the poor, that he is presiding over a massive redistribution of power to the man and the woman in the street. This is how he talks all the time revolutionary language. <coughs> what appear to be citizens' rights movements are in fact orchestrated by billionaire industrialists. In the US, so-called AstroTurf campaigns, fake grassroots campaigns, are organised by energy giants against climate change legislation and by private health corporations against the state provision of health care. Campaign advert and, and you know this, these kinds of tactics are very widespread. You know, bussing in ordinary citizens to um, these fake rallies, the mass production of of what looked like handmade banners in demonstrations, the, the town hall meetings, creating this sense of sort of fake authenticity of, of sort of down to earth political protest and so on, which are um, deliberately and, and um, systematically orchestrated by um, corporate um, uh, marketing departments and, and lobbying departments. Um, campaign adverts for one Republican senator employ actors with what the casting agent calls hickey, blue collar, coal miner or trucker looks in order to portray the Republicans as the party of the working class. The populist, town hall based, homemade banner waving tea party reinforces this illusion. <clears throat> the phrase people power is widely abused by politicians announcing symbolic initiatives or carrying out measures that actually serve to disempower ordinary people. And I have a Google um, news alert set up um, for the phrase people power, and I get about 10 results every day <laughs> from um, national and local media on so called people power initiatives which are supposedly defeating corporations and political elites at a time when the reality is the reverse. A glaring example of this misuse of people power was David Cameron's use of the phrase to outline his so-called big society scheme whereby state funding would be cut and ordinary people would be asked to plug the gaps in, social, in public services. Political and financial power per se is also bolstered by performances of humility. Government in Britain proceeds through fake consultation, feedback and online direct democracy through apparently humiliating U-turns which are actually a way for manifesto promises to be jettisoned. And this happened with the recent reform of the health service, there was a sort of um, listening exercise, people were encouraged to provide feedback via the internet um, to, to this government consultation. In, increasingly, these consultations and inquiries are, are, are serving this, this fig leaf function more and more. You know, 
and so many inquiries are ongoing at the moment in, in Britain, um, and they are a sort of a, a substitute for representative democracy and, and, a, and a, a way for power to, to, um, to be legitimated. Um, I'm going to stop uh, <coughs> uh, talking about the cover, I out of time. Um, bankers and corporate CEOs are schooled in the art of apology so that reputations can be managed and profits can continue to rise. Just as royal hegemony is legitimated in the wildly popular film The King's Speech by the apparent vulnerability produced by the King's stammer, political leaders consolidate their hegemonic power by organising these listening exercises after policies are criticised, ensuring that hecklers at party conferences are subsequently reclaimed as ordinary heroes, and encouraging their wives to produce humbling revelations about their dirty socks. <coughs> <coughs> Critique and protest is thereby contained. <coughs> When the Liberal director, Danny Boyle, celebrated National Health Service nurses and trade unionists in his opening ceremony for the 2012 Olympics, the Conservative Mayor, Boris Johnson, appeared to approve. He wrote, the thing I loved was the heavy political stuff. I loved the emergence of the urban proletariat in this performance. And so the anti-establishment potential of Boyle's ceremony could therefore be safely diffused. <coughs> As fake action on the environment uh, replaces real action, greenwash techniques become widespread in our politics and our media. An oil company, BP, colours its petrol stations in an environmentally friendly shade of green. Ed Edinburgh Airport, which is an airport, publicises an initiative where local school children plant 500 trees, and this is supposed to save the world. Coca-Cola unveils its plant bottle with great media fanfare at the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Change Summit. But just 15% of this plant bottle is made from plant-based material, whatever that means, and plant bottles only make up 0.3% of the company's annual drink sales. And I think our action on the environment is increasingly following this sort of PR-driven, um, uh, sort of role model, um, uh, exceptionalism model, where companies promote these very exceptional examples of good practice and therefore obscure the, the bulk of their um, polluting practices. As food production becomes ever more industrialised, our TV schedules are filled with wildly popular retro authentic programmes about baking cakes. The most recent is the Great British Bake Off. And this 1950s kitchen aesthetic fits perfectly and silently with both an anti feminist fetishising of the domestic and right wing austerity. Michelle Obama makes TV programmes about the organic vegetable garden that she had planted on the White House lawn, while the US Department of Agriculture quietly courts agribusiness giants such as Monsanto. And this austerity aesthetic is everywhere. <coughs> I was talking last night about the ubiquity of um, tea towels with the slogan, keep calm and carry on. And um, you know, the Second World War blitz spirit is invoked to, to produce a kind of national quietism just keep our heads down and you know, crochet our oven gloves and so on. Um, as a handful of new media giants take control of the web, Yahoo's slogan is, the internet is under new management, yours. And Vodafone makes an advert entitled, Our Power, using the slogan, Power to You, which takes credit for the Arab Spring, even though the company actually caved in to government pressure to shut down their network during the protests. The digital revolution exploits the language of the 60s liberation as it ushers in a stifling corporate monopoly of our journalistic, literary and cultural life. As wages stagnate and workers are asked to put in ever increasing hours, work is reframed as morally improving and as the meaning of life. The explicit contract between employer and employee is replaced by the fake liberality of casual dress, 
table football, free food and away days and the increasing productivity of workers is stealthily exacted through compliance and cooperation. The exploitation of free labour is valorised by the spectacle of euphoric volunteers at the London Olympics and this valorisation of volunt voluntary work I think is going on, um, on in the online world and the way in which we can all provide our, our intellectual um, and journalistic labours for free um, but via blogging and so on. But, but, but this voluntarism is framed as a form of, of <coughs> emancipation and empowerment. <coughs> Structural attempts to tackle inequalities of social and economic status, gender, race or religion are being abandoned in favour of PR and media driven displays of exceptional success. Role model schemes have become obligatory in equal opportunity policy, crime prevention initiatives and so called human resources. TV talent shows enshrine the illusory effectiveness of Thatcherite aspiration, distracting their viewers from the broader reality that social mobility is in swift decline. The flip side of these showcased exceptions is that if you do not succeed, you only have yourself to blame, since everyone in principle can now make it. The grotesque public expenditure on a royal wedding is legitimated by endearing footage of Prince William humbly cleaning a toilet on a student expedition to Chile. Politicians and celebrities arrange photo opportunities for the rare occasions that they travel on public transport. And the implication is that these people are just like you and me. A plus size model appears on the cover of one or two fashion magazines prompting commentators around the world to hail a new era in the fashion world where women's bodies are apparently now being realistically represented. The success of Paralympic athletes in London this summer is used as a pretext for silencing those commentators and journalists who attempt to discuss the practical difficulties faced by disabled people in their everyday lives at a time of austerity driven cuts in living allowances for these people and actually journalists covering the London Olympics, uh, the, the Paralympics, were ex given explicit instructions to not talk about the broader difficulties faced by disabled people and just focus on this good news story of Paralympic success. State leaders use the vocabulary of respect and tolerance when they talk about the inclusion and integration of religious minorities but this is lip service which serves to obscure the real deficit of power and status that minorities such as Muslims face in many Western countries. And you mentioned you know, the, this discourse of tolerance and toleration and how that's used. You know, it is used frequently by the word um, to, to mean the very opposite of um, something benign or truly equal. <coughs> The ideological culture we've developed today is undoubtedly the result of the rise of marketing, spin and PR and the extension of these practices into every corner of our public and private lives. But there is a particular characteristic to modern ideological deception which I think very effectively throws its critics off the scent. And this is that modern deception thrives on ubiquitous rhetoric of authenticity, transparency and participation. This is an age of embedded reporters and user generated content, <coughs> of unbranded community personality Starbucks cafes with fair trade coffee beans displayed in rustic baskets <coughs> and a notice board for local events. Fake authenticity makes deception into a shared public delusion <coughs> this is particularly clear in the case of cyber utopianism. The internet is praised as a medium of great immediacy and direct um, citizen participation, <coughs> and yet it's producing a spectral world of screens, mediation, representation, and unreality. The internet is eulogised as a revolutionary good, and yet the rise of futile clicktivism 
and the decline of investigative journalism makes it harder to hold power to account. And regressive political agendas, which denigrate women in particular, are at work in apparently realist scientific discourses, such as evolutionary psychology and neuroscience. The kind of co-option that Savoy Zizek, Thomas Frank and Naomi Klein have described, whereby capitalism adapts to anti-capitalist critique by incorporating the symbols of that critique into its own lexicon, is now endemic. Problems and solutions have become inextricably entwined, and opportunities for challenge and resistance are ever more difficult to sustain as terms such as local, artisanal or people power are transformed into corporate branding. This produces a kind of cultural and political paralysis because any instance of genuine authenticity, whether that's political action or a handmade patchwork quilt, can become instantly ersatz, mass-produced and appropriated. So I'd like to call for a, rev a revival of the analysis of covert ideology, both inside and outside the academy. And if you see this going on within the academy, um, then please let me know, because I'd like to collect instances <laughs> of this revival. Um, <laughs> and I also want us to understand um, how notions like authenticity, consumer savvy, and people power are being used against us in our name. I believe we need the insights of Althusser and Gramsci as never before. We need Althusser's insight the, uh, that ideology is not only a top-down conspiracy or mode of oppression, that it's dispersed and dissipated, internalised and maintained by collusion. It's in the drinking water. I'm always amused, for example, by the unusually explicit use of the word compliance in management speak. And we need Gramsci's analysis of hegemony as concealed, indirect or soft power, power that makes use of containment strategies and safety mechanisms such as apologize, ap apologies, U-turns, humility tropes and requests for engagement and feedback. I'd also like to see more discussion of related questions such as whether the 21st century West is more covertly ideological than other places or other eras in history. If we do believe that covert ideology is now endemic in the West, do we therefore assume that this is not the case in less developed countries, and is that assumption patronising? Or is there something about our late democratic moment in the West, or post-democratic moment, that does lend itself to complex forms of deception and manipulation? Is there a correlation between late democratic <coughs> complacency and public delusion? Or is the, is the correlation more paradoxical and indeed tragic between democratic progress and ideological sophistication? Perhaps we are seeing in inchoate form the return of, aware, of an awareness of covert ideology and false consciousness in discussions about behavioural economics and irrational decision, economic decision making. This kind of inquiry explores why we do not necessarily act in our own best interest, for example, by eating too much fatty or salty food, or not paying maximum contributions to our pension plans. But behavioural economics actually reimports a kind of positivist mastery by attempting to analyse how, how and why we spend money according to supposedly scientific and often neuroscientific criteria. And there is little emphasis on the social and cultural forces acting upon us. And, and you see an allied trend in political theory um, uh, nowadays. That a lot of books like David Brooks's books of the social animal, which are exploring um, not sort of rational political contestation, but rather the sort of irrational context in which we act as political subjects, looking at um, you know in intuitive um, processes and <coughs> the sort of emotional context of, of political action. So this is really a determined move away from um, from overt ideological um, debate and contestation to a much more contextual, intuitive, anti-rational. Um, neuroscientific um, emphasis within political thought, which I think is 
really damaging. Um, and behavioural economics is closely allied to nudge policy, um, which exploits the awareness of our susceptibility in order to shape our behaviour for the benefit of political elites and commercial profit. <coughs> so I'd like to turn now <coughs> to what I perceive to be a public hostility to the concept of overt ideology. <coughs> in contemporary political discourse, ideology has become curiously toxic, almost a new taboo. To subscribe to an ideology these days is denounced as either naive or sinister. In 1999, Tony Blair declared that the political debates of the 20th century, the massive ideological battleground between right and left, are over. Blair, and in the US Bill Clinton, pioneered the apparently post-ideological third way. David Cameron declared in 2009 that he will, will not be the prisoner of an ideological past and that he doesn't do isms. In a 2005 article for The Economist, Jose Manuel Barroso, president of the European Commission, wrote that Europe was now focusing less on ideology and more on results. <laughs> and in a speech in Philadelphia in 2009, Barack Obama claim that what is required is a new declaration of independence from ideology. The new James Bond film, Skyfall, is the first film of the so-called franchise whose villain is motivated by personal vendetta rather than political ideology. The film is full of retro symbolism, from its orchestral theme tune to its fondness for vintage cars, but like the empty use of the 1960s or communist phrase, people power, by contemporary right-wing politicians, it's retro-styling with the ideological substance drained out. When politicians use the word ideology today, it's simply a way of criticising the opposition. They are motivated by ideology. We are simply doing what works. In the UK, the coalition government is working together in the national interest. There's that Second World War imagery again. In the US, Obama has pursued a supposedly benign, cooperative, bipartisan consensus. The rise of the Tea Party may appear to have heralded a new political age in the States, but the Tea Party is deliberately decentralised. There is no headquarters and no manifesto to announce its ideology. It's anti-state and ostensibly anti-political, although it obviously has a covertly political corporate agenda. American politics, like British and to a large extent European politics, has taken a peculiar anti-political turn. Politicians from Angela Merkel to Nick Clegg, Barack Obama to Joseph Lieberman, the independent candidate in the States, have embraced the non-partisan centre ground, as if that political place actually exists, and as if it's fixed and can't be moved according to political persuasion. And along with ideology, the word divisive has also become an insult. I regard this development as both bizarre and damaging. Why should it be a bad thing for politicians to have political principles that are different from other politicians? But differentiated idealism, and indeed democratic choice itself, are now regarded as forms of utopian delusion recalling Napoleon's windbags and dreamers. When a general secretary of the British <coughs> Unite Union criticised Labour leader Ed Miliband for refusing to condemn the government's public spending cuts, a former Labour Home Secretary said the union leader was on the delusional left. Miliband is the only leader capable of bringing a new morality to our society, he said, but he'll only do it by living in the real world not some fantasy utopia based on outdated ideology. And you, see, and you hear this kind of formulation um, again and again in political discourse. In this age of so-called austerity, pragmatism and technocracy, sorry, in this age of so-called austerity, pragmatism and technocracy are the ostensibly neutral vehicles for neoliberal policies. Democracy has become a luxury we cannot afford. The austerity measures being imposed in Europe are not framed as political choices. 
They are framed according to the principles of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine as economic necessity. Any whisper of an alternative is silenced by the divine judgments of the bond markets. And you don't need me to tell you that. What the writer and theorist Mark Fisher refers to as capitalist realism now stands in for political idealism. Since when did ideology become a dirty word? A crucial moment was the beginning of the 1990s and the fall of communism, or rather the way in which the fall of communism was popularly interpreted. Francis Fukuyama famously claimed that history had ended and one ideology, capitalist democracy, had triumphed over all others. This triumph, he argued, had put an end to the world's big ideological battles. Although his view has been derided as cartoonish, it became the mainstream view. With the financial crash, the Arab Spring, and the resurgence of protests around the world, we are now seeing that thesis challenged again. For example, by the British journalist Seamus Milne's recent book, The Revenge of History. But for me, the crucial question remains largely unasked. If history has not in fact ended, then how will ideological contestation and ideological change happen if ideology itself has become toxic? Fukuyama's claim is being challenged now on the grounds of events, but what about political ideas? And there are related questions that persist about how we regard Fukuyama's claim and, uh, and overt ideology now. Is, uh, is democracy an ideology or a choice of, 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 of ideologies? And what about the fact that many countries, including China, Russia and countries in the West with corrupt or technocratic governments, seem to be entering a post-democratic phase? Is the right as ideological as the left? It seems to me that the left is often regarded as more ideological. The right has allied itself most closely with austerity and expediency, creeds which frame themselves, as we have seen, simply as realism. Capitalism is an ism, but it denies that it's an ideology at all. The market presents itself as a basic form of nature, like Darwinian evolution. And there's a related question about capitalist ideology. Is it the case that whereas communism is often regarded as a great idea in theory, less so in practice, that capitalism has never really been enacted, although some would argue that communism has never really been enacted either. Both the left and the right complain that the free market has not been properly free it's been rigged by cronyism or reined in by regulation? Or is it the case that the inevitable monopolistic consolidation of capital means that the pure ideology of bottom-up market capitalism can never be realised? That for all the talk of realism, it remains a dream? And does this ironically ensure capitalism's continued promotion this question has been explored by Marxians in the past, but it's been reanimated in the wake of the bank bailouts of 2008-9. And, and of course, it's ironic that with the great failure of capitalism, what people are calling for now on the right is a, a more determined application of capitalist principles. That only, if you can only really institute capitalism for, you know, properly, then everything will be fine. It seems clear in any case that the death of ideology thesis conceals the silent promotion of a particular ideology, neoliberalism. I believe that the attack on overt ideology has driven it underground, and that as a result of disavowing overt ideologies, covert forms of ideology have come to dominate our politics and culture. Overt ideology is dead, long live covert ideology. And those, over, and those covert forms of ideology, of course, benefit elite interests. So if the narrative of the death of ideology is itself an ideological move, therefore, then neoliberalism's triumph is therefore not the result of open warfare, as Fukuyama suggests, but rather of the more deceptive and covert operation of the camera obscura. 
So, since this conference is about discourses that matter, I'd like to ask if there are now signs of change. Will Occupy and the other protest movements around the world find their ideological direction? Are there slight deepenings of clear blue water between Obama and Romney, Cameron and Miliband, Samaras and Tsipras? Or is it the case that ideology, that ideology is irrevocably toxified? With all its structural and technological innovations, it seems as if the Occupy movement is curiously unable to articulate a coherent blueprint for social and political change. And when they do come close to doing so, they seem to be reinventing an old left-wing language that has become impossible to speak out loud. There's a telling passage in Gary Steingart's recent novel, Super Sad True Love Story, a dystopian vision of the near future in which a bipartisan government has achieved near totalitarian control of America. A character who is an organiser of an anti-government resistance movement, rather like Occupy, explains to a fellow presenter, uh, protester, when we lost touch with how much we really hate each other, we also lost the responsibility for our common future. I think that when the dust settles and the bipartisans are history, that's how we're going to live, as small units who don't agree. I don't know what we'll call it, political parties, military councils, city-states, but that's how it's going to be and we're not going to screw it up this time. I like this passage because it's a rare acknowledgement that cross-party cooperation is not as benign as its image suggests. And it points to what seems to me to be a priority for the newly resurgent left to re-embrace re explicit ideological contestation. And indeed, the structural and organisational concerns of the new left, particularly in its internet-based resurgence, seem to me to be closely related to its ideological paralysis. There is a kind of vanity of process to the iconoclastic attempt to replace leaders, authority, hierarchy and so on with more horizontal modes of action, which threatens to obscure the substantive impetus for change, rather in the same way as the, um, the astroturf movements disguise the continued operation of um, elite power. Unwittingly, there's an unwitting parallel there, I think. The structural concerns are a kind of metaphor or model for the kind of society these activists would like to see implemented more broadly. But without top-down organisation, they remain a microcosm. I would like to see the left reclaim concepts of authority and leadership, and to recognise that ideological disagreement is the best defence against totalitarianism. Ideology needs to be disentangled from the toxic connotations of 20th century totalitarianism. Does the fact that the big 20th century ideologies ended up in Auschwitz and the Gulag mean that a return to grand projects will, become, will remain unpalatable? Is our political predicament a sign that we are at a critical juncture in a much broader sense, whose contours are only just becoming visible? Is our situation analogous to art history or the trajectory of pop music? that we've had modernism and postmodernism, and now we're in a post-postmodern age of the retro-authentic mashup. It seems relevant to me that if you listen to a contemporary pop song, it's literally impossible to discern in which decade it was produced. It feels as if we have entered an oddly disorientating era of accelerated information, in which news events feel all-encompassing but then rapidly disappear without trace. In this fragmentary predicament of absorption and erasure, it feels very difficult for us to consider ourselves to be in the age of anything and for any coherent movement to take hold. And this is a real problem because without the political language to articulate an alternative, we're stuck with the existing order. I think we're really in an unprecedented situation here, and it's not at all clear to me how it's going to develop, <coughs> not to mention the fact that we're, if we're facing a climate change Armageddon, then political inflection 
will pale by comparison to existential crisis and concrete survival. But what does seem clear to me is that even if threats become existential, there will still be covert ideology. In a virtual airbrushed world saturated with PR and marketing, I want authenticity and realism to be recognised as elite power's new disguises. I believe that optimism begins not with jubilant claims of the new world order that we hear so often, but with <coughs> critique. And if there is less credulousness about covert ideology, there will be more constructive belief in overt ideology. I think the act of unmasking is itself transformatory, and that the co-option of critique is never total. I heard the philosopher John Gray tell a story recently about Silvio Berlusconi's media strategist, who was once asked where he learned the tricks of his trade. The media strategist replied immediately, from Guy de Boer. <laughs> we have to hope that the story is a pop form. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> extremely relevant, opportune and uh, stimulating uh, talk.